It had been over a thousand years since anybody had written or understood Egyptian hieroglyphs. Many had tried to decipher this hieroglyphic script and failed. So how did Jean-Francois Champollion succeed where others had failed for centuries before him? What were the keys to his success? Well, stay tuned because that's what we'll be talking about today. Welcome to the Dead Speak Online, where we demystify the words and lives of the ancient Egyptians through animated videos like this one. If you're new here, consider subscribing. The year is 1822, and scholars have finally been making some headway for the past several years into understanding ancient Egyptian scripts. Both the most famous hieroglyphic script and also a script called Demotic, which is basically a cursive script that was used from the late period on through the rest of pharaonic history. The recent breakthroughs have been largely due to the French army's 1799 discovery of a peculiar stone that was in a military fort wall at the town of Rashid, often called by its Greek name Rosetta. This curious stone, which would come to be called the Rosetta Stone, had been reused to build that wall, but it was clearly ancient, as it had three inscriptions on it, one in Greek, one in Demotic, and one in hieroglyphs. Using the texts from the different sections of the Rosetta Stone, which are identical in content, though written in two different languages and three different scripts, scholars such as J.D. Ockerblad and A.I. Silvestre de Sessi made significant contributions to understanding Egyptian writing, especially the Demotic script. For this script, they had figured out things like the names of kings and queens, some pronouns, and also a few other words that were in the Demotic section of the Rosetta Stone. With this groundwork lane, the English polymath Thomas Young was able to compare the hieroglyphic sounds that appeared in ovals, or what we call cartouches, to the royal names such as Ptolemy and Berenike that appeared in the Greek script on the Rosetta Stone. By doing this, Young was able to figure out that there were some phonetic sounds in ancient Egyptian and figure out what they sounded like. For example, a hieroglyph that looks like a box is like our letter P, a bread loaf is like our letter T, and a piece of folded cloth is like the sound os. Although today we actually understand that this sound is like our letter S without the vowel. Before this time, it was universally believed that ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs were purely symbolic. That is, that signs or groups of signs represented concepts, ideas, or things, but not sounds such as you would have in an alphabet or a syllabic script. This new work showed that there were actually some signs that could be used to represent sounds, at least for when transcribing foreign names such as the Greek name Ptolemy. The other Egyptian script on the Rosetta Stone was assumed at this time to be an alphabet. However, Young figured out that Demotic had actually developed from hieroglyphs, and there was basically a cursive script form of the hieroglyphs because he recognized the similarity of some of the signs. This caused a problem, since it was believed at this time that Demotic was purely phonetic, that is sound-based, and an alphabet. And at the same time, hieroglyphs were considered to be purely symbolic, carrying no sound value, with the exception of when they were used to write foreign names. Young determined that, in fact, Demotic was composed of both symbolic or conceptual signs as well as alphabetic signs. However, he was unable to take the next step and apply this same idea to the hieroglyphs. Enter the Frenchman Jean-Francois Champollion, who since a boy had studied an extensive number of written languages and had become an expert in Coptic, the final stage of the ancient Egyptian language and the one that's still used in the Egyptian Christian church. Now, initially, Champollion had the same ideas as everybody else in terms of thinking of hieroglyphs as purely symbolic. But by 1822, he had changed his mind, at least in relation to foreign names, just like Thomas Young had. However, once he'd made the shift in his ideas about the Egyptian hieroglyphs, he was able to figure out many more phonetic signs than Thomas Young had done, 
and he did this by examining the names of Greek and Roman rulers that occurred in other Egyptian texts. Luckily, by 1822, Champollion now had access to copies of many more inscriptions than had been available to researchers previously. In these inscriptions, most notably perhaps the so-called Banks obelisk, he had access to a variety of Greek and Roman names. The Banks obelisk, for example, had a text in Greek on its base and then Egyptian hieroglyphs on the main part of the obelisk. And while the two texts were not actually identical, they both had the royal names of Ptolemy and Cleopatra in them that Champollion could use to compare. By this time, he had also gained access to a papyrus that had a text in both Greek and in Demotic. And with this, he was able to figure out how the name Cleopatra was written out in Demotic. This breakthrough in Demotic allowed Champollion to hypothesize how Cleopatra would be spelled in hieroglyphs, because he had already recognized the equivalencies between many Demotic and hieroglyphic signs. Between this and the hieroglyphs that he already knew from the names on the Rosetta Stone, particularly for the sounds of L, E, O, and P, he was able to identify the name of Cleopatra on the Banks obelisk. To test whether he was correct in interpreting the second royal name on the Banks obelisk as being Cleopatra, Champollion started applying the same method to other names that he could find in hieroglyphs, at least foreign names. So for example, he looked at this particular name in a cartouche, for which we already knew some of the signs from the work on the Rosetta Stone. So from that, we would have A, L, an unknown sign, S, E, another unknown sign, and then T, R, and another unknown sign. Champollion guessed that this entire name would actually include the sounds A, L, K, S, E, N, T, R, S, which would be equivalent to the Greek name Alexandros, or as we say in English, Alexander. Champollion continued on in this manner for all of the foreign names that he could find. Around this same time, Champollion received copies of inscriptions from the temple at Abu Simbel. In this inscription that he received, there was a royal name that he had not deciphered yet, an Egyptian name. And the name appeared several times written in slightly different ways, but the simplest form of the name had only four signs. And as luck would have it, Champollion already knew the last two signs, S and S. The first sign in the cartouche looked like a sun disk, so Champollion guessed that it might have the same phonetic value as the Coptic word for sun, Re. So then he had Re, an unknown sign, and then two S's. He thought about what was already known about Egyptian pharaohs from the Greek history of Egypt that was written by an Egyptian priest named Manetho in the third century BC. And he realized that this name bore a striking resemblance to the name of Ramses that occurred in that history. And from that, he guessed that the middle sign must represent the sound of the letter M. Champollion then moved on to a copy of another text that he had that also had a cartouche with an Egyptian king's name in it. The first sign in this case was a picture of an ibis, a type of bird. And it was known that the ibis was a symbol for the god Thoth. Champollion put this together with the other signs that he now knew and realized that this name must be Tutmosis, the name of a pharaoh from the 18th dynasty who was named in Manetho's history of Egypt. Champollion then realized that the sign that he had originally thought was like the letter M was used on the Rosetta Stone in places where the Greek text talked about birthdays, suggesting that the sign actually wrote out the word for birth, which in Coptic was Mise. Now, since hieroglyphs only actually represent consonants and not vowels, the sign actually stands for the consonants M and S and doesn't represent the vowels. Now that Champollion had figured this out, he finally had the key. He was able to keep going to the next name and the next name. When he made this breakthrough, Champollion reportedly ran to his older brother's office, burst in, and announced, I've done it! 
He then passed out before he could tell his brother what it was he'd done. He was unconscious for five days, but as soon as he awoke, he went straight back to work. And only about a week after that, he was already presenting this new breakthrough at the Academy of Inscriptions and Belles Lettres. He would go on to publish this lecture the following month as the now famous Lettre à M. Dacier. However, up to this point, Champollion still believed that hieroglyphs were still symbolic or represented ideas or things and not sounds, except for when they were used in names. It was not long after this, though, that he finally was able to make this leap, and then he was able to take the next big step to create his new system, or key you could say, to move on from names to actual Egyptian vocabulary. So how did he do it? Well, Champollion never actually explained his exact process, but we can put together a few events from the time to help explain his breakthrough. First, he realized that there were not nearly enough unique hieroglyphs in the Egyptian version of the text in the Rosetta Stone to be able to say everything that the Greek version said, if the hieroglyphs were purely symbolic. Perhaps he was also influenced by the recent publication of a grammar of Chinese, which now showed that many of the signs in Chinese were phonetic, that is, they represented sounds, rather than representing things or ideas. Whether this was influential or not, Champollion now finally realized that many Egyptian hieroglyphs were indeed purely phonetic. Once he had this piece of the puzzle, Champollion was able to use his intimate knowledge of Coptic and its vocabulary, along with his newfound ability to recognize the sounds of many hieroglyphs to start deciphering more and more, hieroglyph after hieroglyph and word after word. He would subsequently publish a more comprehensive study of how the hieroglyphic system of writing worked in 1824. Ever since Champollion published his findings, which he did largely without acknowledging the prior work of Thomas Young, there's been a fierce debate about whether he used Young's ideas without crediting him, or whether Young's discoveries actually had no influence on Champollion, who arrived at the same ideas separately. Now, opinions often fall along nationalistic lines, with those from England tending to see Champollion's work as based on that of Young without due acknowledgement, and those from France tending to see Young as unimportant in the path to decipherment, and Champollion as having been the only serious innovator. While the debate over who should receive how much credit is likely to continue, the British Egyptologist Richard Parkinson perhaps sums it up best by writing, Quote, even if one allows that Champollion was more familiar with Young's initial work than he subsequently claimed, he's still the sole decipherer of the hieroglyphic script. As Peter Daniel states, any decipherment stands or falls as a whole. Young discovered parts of an alphabet, a key, but Champollion unlocked an entire language. If you're interested in learning more about ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs and their decipherment, let me know in the comments below what topics or questions you'd like me to address in a future video. Also, don't forget to take a look in the description for this video where I have a list of books that I recommend on the decipherment of ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. Thanks for watching and see you next time.